and welcome back to another episode of Beyond the To-Do List. I'm your host, Eric Fisher, and this is the show where we talk to the people behind the productivity. This week, I'm glad to welcome back a friend of mine, a productivity podcaster, comrade, Jeff Sanders, host of the 5 a.m. Miracle Show. He's back to talk about his brand new book, The Free Time Formula. We'll get into that as well as what were some of the productivity crises that caused him to write this book. Yes, a productivity person having a productivity crisis. It's refreshing to hear because I've lived it too. And we get into that. We talk about that. We we basically pull back the curtain and let you know that productivity podcasters are not perfect, but we are learning all the time. That's how we come up with all the great stuff to share with you. Again, I think you're going to love this episode with Jeff. It's always awesome to have a fellow productivity podcaster on because it's just great to have a conversation with somebody who loves to talk just as much as I do about productivity in public on a podcast. So here you go. Enjoy this conversation with Jeff. Jeff Sanders. This week, I am thrilled to welcome back to the show yet again, Jeff Sanders, the other productive, well, not the other productivity person, productivity podcaster. There's a number of them. I just left out like five other people that are going to kill me. <laughs> but welcome back to the show, Jeff. Well, thank you, Eric. I'm excited to be the other guy. That's great. Yes. <laughs> we're, we're a breed few and far between, but I have to. So now I've got to be nice and say that there's like Zach Sexton and Mike Vardy and who else do you listen to productivity podcast wise? Yeah, uh, Michael Hyatt, of course. Yes, uh, obviously. The new uh, girl, Amber De La Garza, who yep. I followed recently as well, yep. who is awesome. She's, she's been on here and I've been on her show. Uh, Nick Snap. Yep. So if and if we're leaving anybody out, then, you know, sorry. But uh, yeah. <laughs> those are the people that have been doing it long term, like we both have. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that you get at pretty quickly in your brand new book, and no, this is not just a Jeff shows up to pimp his new book episode, <laughs> but one of the things you get at pretty quickly, which I really find fascinating, is there was a point in time where you were reading a productivity book or and or leadership book, and you were getting nothing out of it. And then you put it down. And I think you picked it back up again later or something along those lines. And then we're realizing that it's not about the information, it's about the implementation, the execution of the information, right? Oh, totally. It, was, it kind of blew my mind because the, the book is The Slight Edge by Jeff Olson, uh, which is a book that was recommended to me for a long time, and I kind of just ignored it, and then I finally did read it, and then I wasn't inspired or you know excited about it at all, and I came back to it probably a year later and realized at that point, wait a minute, I wasn't excited about the book because I'm not doing anything in the book. Mm -hmm. I just read it for information only instead of reading it for, you know, what can I apply to my life today that I'm not already doing? Because there's plenty of things I've, you know, stories I've heard before or lessons I've heard, but if I haven't applied them to my life, they don't mean anything to me. And so I had this big realization that it, 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 it's about action. It's about what, what you do makes the difference. Exactly. And so I think what's going to really endear people to the possibility of yet another productivity book is your story and mm -hmm. where you were at the time. <laughs> Because I remember uh, your Facebook post about this and then that you included it as the intro in your book about your trip to the emergency room. I would love it if you would share that story. How did you find yourself in the emergency room and then peel back layers and tell us how the heck did that happen? It was a fascinating and really bizarre story for me. So the actual like the day of was uh, I can tell you to explain how the medical kind of part of it. Um, I was eating a big salad. And I was chewing my food, thought I was chewing it well. Some of the salad got jammed in my esophagus. And I had what the doctors later called an esophageal spasm, where the food got stuck um, in the esophagus. So I could still breathe just fine, except that the food was going nowhere. And so all this pressure built up in my chest. My esophagus began to spasm and kind of like freak out. Uh, the muscles of my chest began to spasm and freak out. And it felt like a heart attack. And so I then I couldn't breathe well. I got nauseous, lightheaded. I started panicking. And this went on for probably 20 minutes of me just like feeling horrible. And so my wife was in the other room. I got her attention. And then she well, at first was going to drive me to the hospital herself. But I got into the car and like had another panic attack because it felt too small and I was still panicking. And so then she called 911. We had an ambulance come. By the time the paramedics arrived, though, I was feeling okay, uh, but they were still convinced that I was having a heart attack, and so they wanted me to go to the hospital, so I did. And I got there, and everything at that point, it kind of calmed down, and I felt okay. Uh, so at the end of the kind of 
ER experience, uh, basically I had freaked myself out, had this fluke experience with food being stuck in my esophagus. And I was convinced it was just kind of a one-time thing that, you know, I didn't chew my food well enough. But the doctor at the hospital was like, you know, this is a stress induced thing. This is not just you chewed your food poorly. Like you caused this for other factors. And that was a real smack in the face. And I was trying to figure out like, well, how did I get myself to this point? And looking back at it, that actual day it happened was the final day of the launch of a product I was doing. I had a lot going on. I had been working on, oh my God, so many projects in the weeks going up to that date. Um, I had basically said yes to as many things as I possibly could. Everything from recording new audiobooks, signing a new book deal, giving speeches, making new products. Like I had just piled on the work for myself. And then, of course, in the middle of all that, other things showed up I didn't see coming. And so my book schedule became like overflowing so fast. And so I, I got super stressed out. And I basically had put, you know, put myself in that position for that to happen. And so when I finally had the ER experience, it, it should have been a no brainer. I should have you know, seen it coming, but I didn't. And I thought that I could handle more. Like I'm a very ambitious guy and I kind of had this assumption that, you know, I can just drink some more coffee and handle it, uh, which is not true. <laughs> and I've got a real <laughs> wake up call that that's not the case. And so, yeah, I think that it was basically months in the making of me, you know, being ambitious, wanting to do more, wanting to kind of be the productivity guy. And then in that kind of desire to achieve, I just did not have the balance. I did not have a lifestyle that could sustain me long term. And I was just pushing too hard. And my body freaked out. And that was basically what happened to me. So I've had not ER type stuff, but I've had slight panicky attack type things. I think I've alluded to once or twice on this show that uh, I had a, a similar type of instance uh, a couple of different times where I was just like supremely overwhelmed, had said yes to too many things. Uh, it was also during like the darkest times of the year. You know how that goes, where there's less sunlight and just my mood and my eating habits and my overloaded schedule with a day job, a podcast and this other might what should have been a minor project what, that kind of ballooned perspective wise and then realized, you know, as I was into it later that uh, it was much smaller than I originally thought, but I didn't sit down and do the actual, you know, homework on it. So. I'm not near as, you know, <laughs> over committed or panicked and or stressed to have gone to the emergency room, but I can relate in some ways. And it's one of those lessons, you know what I mean? Like, it's one of those things where like, yeah, you wish you'd like seen it coming and prevented it. But do you feel like being on the other side of it? You're almost glad it happened. Yes. In a I weird mean, way, I, you mean? Yeah. Well, I mean, no one wants a bad thing to happen to them, but there's always something to be learned from it. And there's no doubt that, you know, looking back at the schedule I had created, I mean, this was just a, a bomb waiting to explode. And I, because of that, I can see it coming now so much more clearly. Like I can feel when my body is overstressed. I can feel when I need to just take a nap or just stop working for the day. Like it's so much more clear to me now, you know, where to draw, to draw the line and where to say like, okay, I need to back off. I need to quit more projects and, you know, undo what I've said yes to. And I feel like I have that awareness now, whereas before I just had the assumption that whatever it is, I can handle it. Whereas I don't have that attitude anymore. I, I, don't, I don't approach things that way. In fact, it's kind of the opposite. It's whatever it is, I'm going to say no to by default. And then if it is, I decide that it's super important, I'll make time for it. But then once again, only if it makes sense in context for the balance that my life needs to have. And if I can't say yes to those things with those you know, parameters in place, then I can't say yes to it. And, and that's a much like finer line than I've ever drawn before uh, to really make sure that I'm not going to find myself back in the hospital again. Yeah, really putting those those boundaries in place, especially because, you know, you and your wife are both self-identified workaholics. So you're yes. <laughs> you have that, uh, you know, you're prone to go that direction of saying yes and being more ambitious and dialing it up and hand me another shot of espresso, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think the other added thing for at least you and me and a few other people is this is what we say we're good at. This is what we've proven we're good at even. And yet when we are bad at it, there's this extra special embarrassment or shame that attaches itself to us because, Oh my gosh, the thing I'm really good at, I've just royally screwed up on. You know, I, I remember this very clearly that when I was um, in the ambulance, like riding to the hospital and I was starting to feel a little bit better at that point, And I had enough clarity to think, 
you know, kind of, okay, how am I going to explain this to my podcast listeners when I get back to my house? Like, how am I going to explain to my audience that this just happened to me? Because I was thinking like rationalizing, how do I explain this in a way that doesn't sound like I just made a huge mistake, but there's, you can't explain, you know, explain that away. Like it, it happened. I screwed up. You know, I put myself in, the, in those shoes like it just it sucked. <laughs> like That's no way to explain it. And so it, it is fascinating, though, that I you know don't want to be in that position. I don't want to be that guy who, you know, talks, you know, the talk, but then doesn't walk the walk. And I feel like this is my kind of glorious you know, misstep that I can now look back on and say, well, yes, I am not perfect. And here's a great example <laughs> for you. Yeah. So you got to walk away from the car crash, luckily. And yeah. now you can say, now, don't do what I did. Right. So let's go into that. Like, obviously, as soon as you got back home, like everything was perfect from that point forward, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I wish. Um, basically, like I got back. The funny thing was I got back from the hospital and I was more stressed out then than I was before the hospital because not only did I just have this kind of like medical fiasco, so I was concerned about my own health. But then, of course, there's the financial aspect of paying the thousands of dollars I now owed for going to the ER, even though I have health insurance, you know, thanks to the U.S. healthcare system. Uh, I still owed a lot of money and I had to still get done the things I had said yes to prior to the hospital. And so I was way worse off for a few weeks trying to figure out how do I kind of undo this chaos to get myself to a place where I could feel sustainable. And that took months. Like it really did take a few months for me to unwind all of that that I had started. And uh, I'm still in many ways kind of going through a process of figuring out how to move forward long term. Uh, I'm, I'm doing much better today than I was back then, but it is it is a long-term journey and a lifestyle shift and a mindset shift uh, to be in a position where you know what to say yes to when it shows up and what to turn down. And it's it's not always clear. It's very subjective. It's very challenging. And you have to really figure out for yourself, like, how does my calendar and my kind of natural inclinations, like, how do those things work together in a way that will still pay the bills and still allow me to feel, you know, sustainable with my health and still make me feel like I'm l doing meaningful work? Like, there's a lot of factors at play. And to figure out that harmonious balance is, is difficult work, but it, it's so important. It has to happen because if it doesn't, then you have those end results like I had, you know, last year. Yeah. So what time frame are we talking? Because I know you sent me uh, a copy of the book early, but I'm pretty sure you had, I mean, uh, duh, you'd send it to me because it was done, uh, which I think was around September. Mm -hmm. So it was before that you'd finished it. So when was, because I know this, this whole incident, I think it was right around the time you said, yes, okay, yes, I've signed off. I'm going to do the book. And then this happens. Yeah, it was really ironic timing because I had signed the book contract in April of 2017. Okay. And my publisher asked me, so what's this book going to actually be about? Because they had pitched me kind of a generic topic on time management. So like, we want you to do a book, you know, to help people, a general audience base for time management. You know, but what's it going to look like, you know, in the specifics? And so I looked at that and said, well, I don't really have anything that I've thought through yet. So let's just kind of dance my ideas back and forth and we'll finalize this the next couple of weeks. Well, in those next couple of weeks is when the ER trip occurred. And so then I had sent an email to my publisher a few weeks later and I was like, guess what? I have a great idea for this book. Like it's <laughs> going to have to discuss this crazy thing that just happened to me and how, you know, my journey to unwind that and what that looks like for me to get back on the other side. And so that became the book's topic was not just the ER trip, but specifically like how do you manage kind of that chaos of, you know, a type A personality figuring out the balance to have the margin, the free time, and the ability to still be productive in the middle of feeling stressed out and overwhelmed and, you know, all of the, the angst that comes with being a high achiever. And so the book topic just kind of fell in my lap as soon as I went to the hospital. And so that's when I realized, like, this is the story I have to tell. So you asked me, you sent the book, obviously, early because you wanted me to write, you know, a, a, an endorsement for it on the book. But also, um, obviously, we wanted I wanted to have you come back on. I was like, as soon as I knew you were doing the book. So I found what I wrote for you for the endorsement. And I was just I just want to read this because now that I've read through the book twice, it really is kind of appropriate. And I think it's where we steer the rest of the conversation uh, for this episode. So here's what I said. I said, imagine being able to fully apply your attention and energy where and when you need it most. Jeff Sanders walks you through why. Free time is a hidden secret of achieving this. Stop distractions, start eliminating nonsense from your life, and make the most of your time and energy. That's I think, and that's the process you've been going through from, from that yeah. point forward. 
So free time, or better yet, the free time formula, when someone hears that, oh, it's a formula. Okay, so it's step by step. That's easy. I can do that. So what is the formula? And is it that easy to follow through on? Well, the formula is just a step by step process, which is what I've you know been doing for years with productivity. It's kind of the way my brain operates is I like to think of things in, you know, in sequence and kind of go step by step to make sure you can get from point A to point B. And the way that I view free time and the way that I kind of approach this in the book is that all of your time is free time. Like you have the ability to do whatever you want, whenever you want. Uh, that sounds like a bold statement because most of us don't view our lives in that way because we feel like, you know, we have responsibilities and obligations. And so the book really breaks down not only is all of your time free time, but more importantly, like you can just kind of start from scratch if you want to or take your life as is and make some changes to it. Uh, but the actual formula is seven steps. It takes you in the beginning from figuring out just where are you today? And then you clarify the things that actually matter to you. And then you begin to take, you know, add in some strategies like making sure that you are as healthy as you possibly can be, making sure you've cut the nonsense from your life so you have the margin to think. And then you begin to actually schedule in the things that matter to you, uh, block the distractions to make sure you can still stay focused, and then have uh, ultimately an ideal uh, rhythm or routine to make sure you can still get the work done and have that margin set aside uh, to take a break and still have that balance. I think some people are probably going to say, okay, that sounds like a great process, but you just said I have all the free time in the world. <laughs> or th in other words, I can decide how much free time I have. What do you mean by that? And, and, so, and I think I know what you mean by that personally. It has to do with one perspective, but I think more importantly, it has to do with accepting the actual ownership that you decide what you do with your time ultimately. Yeah, I had this thought actually a few years ago, back when I my, my last day job that I had, where I was, you know, kind of frustrated. I went to my job kind of upset. I didn't like my boss at the time. I didn't like my job. I was like just like having one of those like rough days. And I had this realization that like, you know what, Jeff, you could just quit today if you wanted to. Like I, I could just walk out the door. And I didn't, but I knew that I could. And as soon as I realized, like, wait a minute, I could quit whenever I want. I felt so much power. I felt like I own my time. I own my day. I can change jobs. I can change careers. I can move across the country, across the globe if I want to. Like, I can do whatever I want. I have just not let myself have that power in my mind. And so that's what I really mean by your time is free time and all free time is all your time. Like everything is the same because we technically can do whatever we want. Now, yes, there are consequences to some of those choices we make, but that's the point, is that you have the choice to be able to say, well, I'm going to choose A over B. When you know that, and you actually live that out every day, it's amazing how that can change what you say yes to and what you don't. Like, do you go back to work tomorrow, or do you just not? Like, you have that power, and I feel like that's such an important thing to start with, because then that gives you the leverage to then choose everything else in the world you're going to say yes to, how your calendar plays out for real, because you know that everything is negotiable and everything you've said yes to, you could just delete and walk away from. And I feel like that starting place is where everything begins, because then you can decide, here's what matters to me, here's why it matters to me, and here's how I'm going to put that on my calendar in a way that's authentic to me, in a way that I want to live my life. And I feel like once you've said yes to that, to that mindset that your time is your own, then you have the control again. Then your life becomes the life you truly want. Have you ever heard or thought about the Einstein time perspective? No. Okay. Uh, so let me see if I can put this out here in a long, like a long story short kind of a format. And I did an episode on this, by the way. So there's, I'll link that up in the show notes. But ideally, it boils down to, uh, and it's, it's from The Big Leap, uh, a book by, I believe, Gay Hendricks. And... Mm -hmm. He it's it's one piece of the entire book, but it's this perspective that personally, I don't think he explains well enough in the book, but it's this whole idea that it feels like time is passing really, really, really slow or at a different moment in time. It feels like time is passing really, really fast, and it's all about your perspective on that time. Hmm. The thing I think he leaves out is that time still is a measurable quantity like it still does even regardless of how you perceive it passing it is still passing at the same amount of time the same the same speed so uh you can't just say well no this one project is going to take me two hours and i'm going to get it done in half an hour that's not <laughs> how that works like it could feel like half hour 
or it could feel like many hours, depending upon if you hate it or love it. But uh, I just wondered if you if that had any play in uh, your perspective at all. Well, I've not heard that theory before, but I, I like the idea because I think that's how you perceive time is is really the whole discussion we're having here. I think it's right. how you look at your whole life to feel like, you know, am I kind of in the moment? I mean, even right now, like having this conversation, like this time we're having is going to feel like a blip on the map to me, like later today. It's like, oh my gosh, what a great conversation. And then and it's over all of a sudden, you know, as opposed to if you're at a job you hate and you're staring at the clock and watching every second tick by, it's like torture. And it's a complete mindset shift to be able to go to a world where, you know, you are kind of living moment to moment in a way that feels so authentic to you. But that's, very difficult if you hate every moment you're going through. And I feel like that's a place I've been in before myself so many times. And I've done a lot to undo those things. And it works so well when you're able to, you know, own the reality that, you know, you put yourself in that in that position. Now, how can you get out of it? I feel like that's a really powerful way to uh, to move forward. I wonder if I've ever told you this story, but uh, I'll tell it real quick. About 10 years ago, when I was working in a certain sales position in an old job, uh, it was a nine, it was a, you know, eight to five hour off in the middle of the day for lunch and not, you know, Monday through Friday. And I was bored to death and hmm. I was outselling everybody else in the office. <laughs> and like, literally, I mean, like we crossed the fiscal year line and out of the sales, like if, if I had to use random numbers, I would say if I had 350 sales for the year, the person below me next and, you know, second place had half that. Mm. And then, you know, on down the row for, you know, another 15 to 20 people below me to where there was a person near the, you know, two or three people or more near the bottom of the, uh, the, the ranking, the list, they, they had done a tenth of what I had done sales wise for the wow. year and yet they showed up and got paid the same as me uh. and so when i caught on to that and said well then i don't need to work any harder how can i compress the time i'm actually executing like here's the thing i actually i compressed the time down and still would get done everything that somebody else would get done in a day i would get done what they did and more in about an hour to two hours in the morning. And then I would revisit everything again and check in on everything in the afternoon. So I was still doing, you know, three to four hours in the day, maybe of actual work. And the rest was mine. And, you know, and I say this now cause they can't fire me, but <laughs> like I was still being, I was still outperforming everybody. You know what I mean? So, and I think that the, the lesson that I should have learned quickly back then is I could have been blogging during that time. I could have been writing. I could have been, I don't know why, like I could have been doing a lot of stuff with that time. And instead I ended up surfing the web and just whittling it away. I mean, the irony there is I had a very similar job and I did spend my time blogging and building a business. <laughs> <That's>, yes. Um, <laughs> I think I so, did tell you this. I think I told, I think we had this conversation at one point, yeah. uh, probably in person off the record. So. Yeah, I mean, my last job, I ended up having, I mean, I would say the equivalent of 10 hours of actual work per week of a 40 hour week job. And so because of that, I had so much extra time and my boss was okay with me spending that time, you know, what he called blogging, which for me was just like web design, podcasting, book writing, like whatever it's I could possibly do. And I was getting paid by the hour to do it. And I, I thought it was amazing. And it, it was amazing. Um, you know, even years later, I look back at that and realize what an opportunity that was. But like that's just acknowledging like there is time on the clock somewhere to make progress on what you care about. And it may not be during your actual working hours, but like there is time every week uh, to make big progress on things. It's just a, it's the puzzle of the calendar of figuring out how to make it work for you. And, you know, I had opportunity that was in front of me. I took advantage of it. You know, we all have things like that. So it's just a question of where are your opportunities and how can you optimize those? And then once you do, it's just so amazing how fast things move forward. Definitely. Yeah. And and so in the book, you talk about the free time formula, like the self-evaluation and the time audit. And only by starting off in a place of knowing what, I guess I'll put it this way, what you're up against or what your commitments are. Because see, for that fact, like I couldn't just quit. I had a commitment in place that like I had to keep going back. Now, here's the thing. Like I get what you're saying. Like I had the freedom to quit. 
Like it was still my decision, but there would have been consequences. And so I had to be aware of those consequences of, Mm -hmm. you know, an upset wife, no, no money in the bank account, et cetera. (laughs) But knowing all those things, doing that self evaluation and that time audit allows me to think, well, wait a second. If I'm only doing that much time wise and I'm outperforming, then they can't touch me. So then what can I use that other time for? Or where can I find other time if that's a completely different scenario for somebody that's listening? You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. I mean, once you understand where you are, like that, that's the point of the the evaluation of the time audit is to get that snapshot of here's where I am today in my life. And then therefore, here's what I have available in front of me that I can already work with. You know, one of the things I point out in the book is that there's already time in your calendar, like today, you could optimize. It may only be five minutes, but it might be five great minutes. And then so the real you know, opportunity immediately is just acknowledging where you currently are. Then, of course, you can begin to figure out how to shift that. But it's that, that acknowledgement, that awareness of where you stand that I feel like a lot of us miss out on because we're distracted, because a lot's going on. It's hard to pause and just acknowledge what's happening because we just keep getting more stuff thrown at us. And I feel like that's why it's so important to like use the time you already have to reflect on what's going on and to get that that acknowledgement and awareness of what's happening because that's the only great first step you can take uh, to actually begin to move everything forward because you know where you are currently are. Exactly. Well, and then the other piece, I think, in terms of that, you know, starting off from an evaluation standpoint and doing that self-awareness, getting that self-awareness in place is we don't always know necessarily what the next step is or what we should be working on. We just know there's lots, there's always more to be working on. Oh yeah, totally. So that can be one of those things. Like, so for example, like had I sat back and done a self-awareness assessment at that time, when I obviously had a way, when I did not know or was not mature enough, I guess, to see that I had an abundance of time that I was not claiming for specific usage, I could have been doing what you were doing. I could have been writing out blog posts or writing up because I was already podcasting at the time. I could have been podcasting. uh, I could have been creating solo shows or making my own show. I was a co-host on someone else's show at the time. And I could have used that time differently. In hindsight, I see that. Back then, I was not either ambitious enough or You know, I just did not have the clarity of thought enough or, uh, you know, actually, no, you know what? I did have ambition, but I had it in that vague sense of I don't like where I'm at, but I don't know what to do about getting where I want to be. I didn't even know where I wanted to be necessarily. You know what I mean? I mean, that was my whole the beginning of my career. Like I uh, left college and the very first blog that I started was called Graduated and Clueless. Because that's exactly where I was. Like, I was in that same position for years where I was just like, I know that I can do a lot of cool things in life, but what in the world am I going to do? And I was stuck there for a long time before I finally began to put the pieces together. But I mean, that, it's a process to at least have the awareness to start somewhere and to acknowledge what is in front of you so you can have that first step. And I know that one thing I think about a lot is that, you know, I may not know what step three or four is going to be. But I know step one, so I can at least do that. Then I'll see step two and step three will show up later on. I feel like that's a big part of my process is that I don't have to know how this whole thing will unravel long term. I just need to know what the next move is and go do that thing. And then when that thing is done, the next step is always clear. And then I just go to that next step. And I feel like that process of just kind of trusting the process of knowing that it's going to be available when it needs to be. I can just focus on one thing at a time, do the next most important thing, and then I'll be able to make that progress over time. Uh, but you do have to kind of acknowledge that there is a first step that can be taken, and then you actually have to you know, do the work and take that first step. And here I am. I'm kind of mixing together the two different things that you talk about at the beginning of the book, where you do the time audit, which is looking at um, – what it what is it you're spending your time on and then the self awareness is really more about you know who are you now where are you where are you what are you doing how are you health wise etc and i think i for me it's easy to blend them all together because i kind of think well if i'm unhealthy it means i'm not spending my time <laughs> on my health. You see what I'm saying? Right. Oh, yeah. So well, that's kind of the point, too. It's like once you have this awareness, you know, answer a few questions and acknowledge where you are. Uh, usually the answers to some common questions 
then align directly to how's your time being spent. And, and, and then you're, you're, to your point about health, like if I don't spend time on my health, it's not a surprise to me if I'm unhealthy. And I feel like that's kind of the, the, the clarity that is it, if we put it on paper and you see it, then you can acknowledge it and then you can actually take action and, and improve it. But it has to start with, with acknowledgement and saying, here it is. Now let's go somewhere. Well, that's one of the things I realize right now is because I wasn't taking care of my health, like I was eating carbs left and right with my breakfast, pizza for lunch, etc. So, of course, it was easy for me to, pe- to just feel like, oh, you know what? I've already done all this work in my cubicle. I may as well just relax now because I've done enough. Mm, yeah. You know? And to, so to actually take advantage of the time that I did have would have meant me spending more time, say, getting up out of the cubicle, you know, returning all my calls, going outside and taking a walk around the building and coming back in, you know, more frequently. Oh, yeah, totally. I think one thing I think about, too, when you mentioned this idea of like, let's let's say like you're on the couch, you're watching TV. Like I have this, I don't know where this came from. Like years ago, I had this vision that like I can only allow myself to sit down on the couch or watch TV or veg out if I've earned it for the day. Like, I don't know where this came from in my head. It's not, not in the book at all. It's just this thought that I had realizing now is like, hey, bonus I've, I've, content. Yeah. <laughs> I've had this mentality that like I have to kind of earn that time. So it, another example of that, if I'm going to watch like a football game on TV, I don't want to be the guy who's like watching these athletes be athletic when I myself have not worked out that day. Like for whatever reason, I feel like I have to earn the time to watch somebody else work out yeah. like a weird way to think about it. But like basically what it is, it is a boundary in my head that says, you know, I need to take care of myself first and then I can have the reward later. Like I can do the work up front and then I get to enjoy you know, the benefits that come with that. And so whatever that looks like to you is fine. But like in, in my head, for some reason, I view it as. You know, today I'm going to make sure that I, you know, eat some healthy food, you know, do a quick workout. And then if I want to, you know, watch TV tonight or watch a football game, I've earned it. It's OK. And overall, the balance there works out. But there has to be some acknowledgement that, you know, there is an input on your part that you have to give something first. And then these benefits are so much more rewarding later on because you really have, you know, you've earned them at that point, which I, which I love. Yeah, that's interesting to me. That's kind of, you know, the whole reward system thing. I, honestly, I'm kind of working on that with my kids right now, just mm. to, you know, with stuff around the house. Like, it's like, wait a second. No, nope, hold on. You want to play a video game or you want to watch a movie or something for an hour or two. You've got to earn that. You've got to, you know, what's the status of your room? Have you done this? You, have, you know, have you unloaded or lo- loaded the dishwasher, et cetera? And I try to do that myself, especially because, you know, I work from home like you do. And it's like, hey, if I could take a break, why don't I go do something that's, quote, other productive, not just digital, uh, you know, knowledge work, but maybe something with my hands. (laughs) So, yeah, I I love the idea of you just using all my time wisely. I think that's one thing that, you know, if I take a break from working at home, I'll go do the laundry or take care of the dishes or whatever, just because it's something else that has to get done. I may as well do that as opposed to just, you know, doing nothing, you know, useful. And like, if my day is filled with more of that activity, it just there's such a sense of accomplishment there at the end of the day. And I don't feel nearly as behind schedule um, with just small things like that that really do add up. The other thing then is this and this is this applies to people not only who work from home, but but I, I you know what? I think it especially applies to people who work from home because we have this I don't know, this this environment that we work in where. We're not surrounded by other people. So there is somewhat of a lack of accountability Mm -hmm. in a way. I mean, do you feel that where it's like, I'm on my own. Like it's, you know, I said, I'm going to do this and it's up to me to make sure I do what I said I'm going to do, you know? I mean, I am a, an extreme kind of guy. So I will do one extreme or the other. So I'm either going to work like 15 hours a day and not sleep, or I'm not going to work at all and just do, could be totally lazy. (laughs) And I'm really, I'm never in between. Like I'm either one or the other. Um, today happens to be a work day. So I was up early today. I'll be working nonstop. I, I can just feel myself going like that's, that's what today is. But I had other days like this weekend, for example, where I just, I had no desire to do anything like completely useless all day long. And that's just how I tend to operate. But I totally get the idea of accountability, especially when you don't have someone there watching you. 
And that I miss part of that, you know, working in an office, you know, years ago, having bosses, having people to be accountable to. I mean, now those people are my customers and I still have to, you know, if I say I'm going to do something, I still have to do it. But there's it's not that day to day sense of being responsible for your time uh, that I kind of miss because there is a lot of value in that. And that's one thing that when you make that switch from working in an office to being by yourself at home, it is not all roses. Like it, there's a lot of challenges there to make it work. And I'm still three years later trying to figure out how to make it all happen. And like, there's a lot of, of, of a balance there that has to be struck to figure out, you know, how am I motivated? How do I get work done? What does it take for me to, to manage my schedule well, to have boundaries, to have accountability? Uh, these are not easy questions. And you have to kind of live through it to see what you tend to do more or less. Uh, and it's, it's not, not as easy as you might think it would be. So not to freak you out even more, but congratulations on your upcoming first child. Oh, yeah. Thank you. And that's going to throw a rock in your whole pond there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, See, because I've yeah. had an issue with, you know, I mean, well, let me give you a picture here. So I my wife and I, we have two kids. One, she just turned 13. So I'm officially the father of a teenager. Jeez. Nice. Yeah. And then I have a six year old son and all four of us got sick at some point over through some point in the mid December through to the first week of January time frame not to mention Christmas break not uh. to mention New Year's and then the weather and school with either 2 hour delays or cancellations and so my rhythm's been completely thrown off and that's with just kids who like can communicate their their wants and needs yeah. it's going to be a whole other thing for you trust me it is. And then for the last, what, five years now I've done my podcast, the number one question that I get that I can't answer is how to be productive as a parent that I've refused to answer myself. So I'm like, until I have my own kid, I'm not going there. Um, luckily, I've had plenty of guests on the show who've given great advice, but I'm excited now to actually kind of embark into that journey and be able to share my own experience because I am very confident that whatever I have learned up to this point is going to be tossed out the window pretty much immediately and I'll have to re, you know, start from scratch again. But uh, I'm excited about that. It should be a lot of fun. Yeah. Although I will say this, you're probably more prepared than I am giving you credit for or that you think you're ready for. In the way that I can say this, like, you know how to make a plan, and I think what it's going to cost you or take from you, I should say, is that ability to, okay, I can hit pause right now, and something's come up with the kid, you know, and you know right where, you know, you, you in other words, have the baton in place to then pick back up from yourself Later on when you can do it, it's going to be hard because of mm. splintered focus. But as long as you enter into it, knowing that and again, treating time uh, in that way where you're saying, oh, you know what? No, I'm going to scale back. I'm going to go to a minimal place. I'm going to get done just the stuff I need to get done. Not plan for more than that. Like, you know, all this stuff already. It's really just in the application of it. Yeah, I know that one thing I have thought about is that when I tend to have, let's say, like you know, an evening that's free right now, I might spend those last few evening hours like knocking out a fun work project. And I know that like time like that may not exist in the future. Like my my habits or things I lean on, you know, will probably have to be completely rethought through uh, to realize like how my life might be a lot more sporadic or a lot more kind of impulsive. And, you know, I, I'm a planner. I like to have things kind of outlined in advance. And I'm very aware that that will have to be much more flexible going forward. And so that's one of my own kind of challenges is figuring out, like, what does my work schedule look like when it doesn't get done in the way that I usually do it? And I'm OK with things changing. It's just a question of what does that new lifestyle look like in a way where the end results are still being, you know, getting done, uh, but just not in the same way they have been so far. And, and then that's what I'm excited to see how that, how that plays out. Yeah. I think you'll handle it well, honestly. I, I think that, you know, all kidding aside, like, I think you've done enough study and execution yourself in the past that I think it's not going to be without its challenges, but you'll rise to the occasion. You'll figure it out. That's the plan. We'll yeah. see what it's going to change your priority or your priorities. I want to kind of get into that a little bit here before we close, because... When we realize and take ownership of our time and we do our self-assessment and even our time audit, we still kind of come out the other end having to still make decisions and put things in order of priority. And some people are like, well, I've got, you know, I've got 25 priorities. These are my priorities. And I'm like, 
but in what order? Like, or how can they all be priorities? Like, what's your perspective on this? Is it you have a priority at the moment, or do you have priorities and you have to prioritize them? Well, I take Greg McEwen's thought on this one. His book, Essentialism, which I, I should mention in my book, um, how the way he like researches the word priority and how it was always singular, and then we made it plural at one point along the lines. But it's not a plural word. Like You have a singular priority at any given time, one thing that matters the most, one thing that needs your attention. And so I take that very seriously when I'm doing my typical kind of planning and scheduling and even throughout my workday of asking myself, like, what is the very next most important thing and how does that get my attention? And I feel like that that challenge of knowing what to do next, like that's everyone's biggest productivity challenge every single day. Like, how do I make that decision of knowing that very next thing? And it's true that we all have lots of things that matter at any given time. And there's lots of projects and lots of tasks and lots of things that will eventually all be addressed, but only one of them actually matters in any given moment. I mean, I use this example a lot in my own podcast that when I'm podcasting or right now, I'm talking to you in this interview, this is my number one priority. Like I'm not eating lunch right now. I'm not doing another project. Like this is it. And to give everything you do that kind of focus is a real mindset shift to be able to say, like, I'm going to give my full self to what I'm doing right now in the moment. And yes, you have to be flexible. Things could interrupt you. But it, as a, a way of thinking and a way of operating, like I want to live in a life where I can give myself fully to one thing at a time. And when I do that and when I have even better, like a longer block of time to do just one thing, it is amazing how much more I get done and how much more focused I am and how much the, the quality of the work improves. Like that's how my book was written last summer was that I had these big blocks of time where that the book was the only thing I focused on. And because of that, I knocked it out really fast, like way faster than I planned to. And that's the power of focus. And it's the power of doing one thing at a time, which is why I think the word priority needs to stay singular, because the only way that you can ever truly do uh, the work that matters most uh, with your full self and, and really making sure the quality bar is always up. And I think even <laughs> even in what you were talking about, where you at one point you said my number one priority, I'm like, well, right. but well, exactly. Like, there's no such thing as number one. Priority. It, it's all number one if it's it, you know, the thing you're yeah, doing. Exactly. Like, there's no number two priority. It either is right. your priority or it's not. And we're just so multitask or split attention uh, prone at this point that we just <laughs> we think we have all these priorities. And and to be fair. Sometimes we have a lot of things going on that are all concurrent. They're different projects at various stages, but yes. they can't all be the priority. Oh, exactly. I have plenty of things that are all kind of ongoing at the same time. But at any given moment, I'm only doing one thing because I'm only one person. You know, I can only do one thing really well at any given point in time. And so I think my my biggest challenge recently is figuring out how to not just let things go, but how do I automate things so I don't have to, you know, have that sense in the back of my mind that I'm missing something. Um, I, I actually had this a talk before that I gave um, as a speech that I gave last year that was based on me going to uh, the podcast movement conference in Chicago, where I was talking to someone at the conference and they were like, well, Jeff, you seem really distracted right now. And I was like, well, it's because I didn't really want to come because I've got so many other things I need to be doing this weekend. And they're like, well, then why did you show up? What are you here for? And I, I realized at that point in time, like I had not given myself even the luxury of going on a work trip without feeling guilt that I was missing things. And so it's that real sense of saying, like, if I'm going to be somewhere, I need to fully be there and I need to make sure that I've scheduled my life in such a way I can be present. And I mean, that was a big shift, you know, two years ago, but I'm still living that out every day of making sure that whatever I'm currently not doing, I'm OK with the fact that I'm not doing it and that I can let myself be present wherever I am. And I think that's even in itself its own challenge to be able to let things go that you're not currently addressing. That's the whole gist behind uh, Rory Vaden's procrastinate on purpose. Yes. Right yes. there in a nutshell. By the way, do you realize that you had that conversation with me in line at Shake Shack? Oh, I did? <laughs> if you had it with other people, then I probably did too. you yeah. did. But that's exactly what you and I talked about standing there in line. I was like, you see... You seem really distracted. What's going on? He's like, I've got all this stuff going on at home. And I'm like, well, so why are you here? And yeah. then you told me and I was like, well, then be here. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's so funny. Yeah, it, it definitely was you. I remember talking to you. Yeah, yeah, that's so funny to me. But yeah, like that's it's amazing to me how true that is, though, and how true it's been as part of my own life the last few years is that I've had a hard time being present because because I, I am ambitious because I want to do a lot of stuff. But it, it's hard to like mentally let go of things when you have so many things you want to see happen. I feel like that's uh, in of itself its own, you know, own challenge to, to overcome. But if you can get to that point and be more present, like I have when I've done that well, it's amazing to me what happens because of it. And so that's kind of my own personal challenge along the way. Yeah, man. Well, I think everybody needs to make it their priority to go grab the full time. Sorry, not the full time, the free time. <laughs> for, it can seem like a full time job. It's yeah. the free time formula, because in the book, it's not just a book like it's not a I'm going to make a point and then eventually I'll show you how to do something like literally you're walking through the process of all the different steps in the formula. So it's essentially one big action plan. Yes. So I, you, you put your money where your mouth is and you put it in the book. And again, I think everybody's priority needs to go be, be to go grab this book, The Free Time Formula by Jeff Sanders. And then once they've done that, they can shift their priority to subscribing to your show if they're not already a subscriber. <laughs> That'd be great. I love that, too. So, Jeff, it's always awesome to, one, see you in person, but two, uh, to talk with you and have it recorded because then everybody else gets to listen in. So of thanks course. for being on the show again. Well, thank you, Eric. It's been a lot of fun today. I always love talking to you. It's, it's, you know, I saw you in person recently in Nashville and it reminded me just how, how great it is to talk to somebody else who is who's smart and who understands productivity. And so I appreciate it a lot. Thanks, thanks a bunch. Thanks, Jeff. I hope that you've enjoyed this conversation. I know that I did. Again, it's always nice for me to talk to a fellow productivity podcaster and then share that with you because I think you get maybe even a little extra boost of productivity conversation when it comes to that. You got to go out and grab Jeff's book, The Free Time Formula. It is out now. I've linked it up in the show notes, which you can find at beyondthetodolist.com slash 212. While you're there, Think of somebody that who needs to hear this conversation and hit that share button across any of the platforms there. Or if you're in your mobile device, hit the share button there. Email it to that person. You know somebody who needs to hear this. Share it with that person. And thanks again for listening. I'll see you next episode.